Aloha, and welcome to Pigments, the Power of Imagination, Season Something, Episode Whatever. I think it's four and seven, respectively, but uh, it's going to be a great show. I know this already because my guests, well, you'll hear about them in a second. I'm here, we're here, to entertain and inspire. I've got a story titled, Imagine the Ghost of Kiev, because the ghost of Kiev was a supposedly Ukrainian fighter pilot flying either the MiG-29 or the Stu-27 in heroic fashion. Turned out to be a myth, but we have the first Western pilot ever to, to qualify in the Stu-27 Fiker. More on that in a second. I just want to thank all of our viewers because the last episode of Figments, The Power of Imagination, was the most watched ever by a long margin. And in fact, we actually beat the movie Top Gun Maverick two to one. Unbelievable. We had 2,000 viewers. They only made $1 billion. Okay, we made $0, but it was a lot of fun and it's a good movie. So we're going to build on that. Now, um, uh, we're going to build on that by talking about flying the Su-27 and putting it into context with the Russian invasion of Ukraine because our guest had a unique opportunity to gain insight to Russia, Russian culture, and the Russian military. That we'll hope with that we share with that. Um, I got an email from a friend of mine who saw that episode and said, he said, and this is for you, Bull Rios. He said, you need more pretty faces on your your shows. <laughs> well, that's not us. We're not just we're not pretty faces, but we do other things. Me and my guest, Major General Retired Dallas Thompson, recently wrote an article I commend to you. The U.S. must counter collective nuclear blackmail available on real clear defense. More on that later. But we're serious guys. And uh, with that, let me welcome Dallas Thompson, Major General, retired U.S. Air Force. Hey, Dallas, Aloha. Hey, sir. How are you? Good. Glad to see you. Gone with the Aloha shirt. You're looking well, marvelous. When in Hawaii, virtually do what the Hawaiians do, I suppose. Yeah. How's the weather in Texas? Is it hot and humid? Hot. Just hot. Yeah, we talked uh, sometime last week when you just come in from a couple hours of yard work. I thought I might lose you, frankly. <laughs> well, it's Hawaii, so we're fine. Boy, you've had an exciting life flying in the Air Force, flying with the Navy, um, and flying with the Russians. Here's a picture of you in action during your exciting, your exciting life. It looks like you're just on the edge of your seat, but in a different way than normal, right? That was the party the first night that after they picked us up at the airport when we got to Tchaikovsky. And uh, it was, I, I described it as an international invitational vodka swallowing contest. My only, my only defense is that it was about two o'clock in the morning. I walked out of the dining room under my own power until I got to that bank of chairs. They carried Ser Sergei out. So I consider <laughs> that a, a moral victory. 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 Um, in this endeavor that we're going to talk about, you were trying to provide capability to the United States Air Force and United States Navy for dis similar air combat training. And I'd like to take a minute to explain that to people. In our last episode, we talked about the difference between Top Gun, the Navy Weapons School, and the Air Force Fighter Weapons School the second, the latter, the Air Force version being more an inclusion of academics, et cetera, et cetera. Top Gun focused on fighting against different airplanes. Now, why is that important? Because they're different airplanes, not just in terms of capability, but merely visually. If you're not looking at one airplane that's, or two or three or four, that's friendly, looking differently from the bad guys, it's very hard to simulate uh, the combat environment. And uh, another thing was a lesson learned from air combat in Vietnam that yes. the, the first time you see a MiG, a bad, uh, you know, the bad guys, there's a bit of buck fever, a bit of shock to the system in seeing that, and the reaction isn't helpful for survival. So both services pursued dissimilar air combat training. They used a variety of airplanes, like the F-5, like the A-4, uh, some from Israel, Kafirs. Mm -hmm. I've got a story about careers, um, but it's always been a challenge, and it's a challenge that continues today. They just stood up the first F-35 aggressor squadron. Yeah, more on that someday. 
but Dallas, you had a chance to provide some real dissimilar air combat training with frontline airplanes that were leased from, from the Russian government, right? How did this happen? How did this start? Well, you re remember in the peace dividend, one of the, one of the first things that went with the budget cuts was the aggressor squadrons. Yep. Uh, after the wall went down, Russian test pilots began attending Society of Experimental Test Pilot Conventions in the United States. This program came together because of the guy, the skipper that hired me into VX4 years before was the at Navy this exchange. Right, the Navy Exchange was at this SETP convention. And he met a what was going to be a Russian cosmonaut on their their equivalent of the uh, or equivalent of the space shuttle, a guy named Sergei Trasvietsky. And they put together this straw man for a, a aggressor program wherein a company would we would lease, dry lease, make 29s or SU-27s. Uh, I, I eventually, as the chief pilot, would be chartered with getting reserve and guard pilots to fly them in the program. And then we would sell this program, not just to the Air Force and the Navy, but worldwide. And so, so it, it all it's began. A would take on a whole new meaning. Right. Oh, man. Uh, when you first heard this concept, we'll talk about how you got involved and what you did. What what did you say in faith in the uh, language we can tolerate? Well, see, I it can't be in language that we can say, but I, <laughs> I can I can paraphrase uh, the the original ask was would I be willing to put together the operational framework and build a briefing that described it, basically so, on my on my own dime, just would I? And then the thing was, if this goes forward, then the full-time employment would be you being one of the aggressor pilots. You, and, and, and that was kind of important because you'd just been furloughed from the airlines. You were I just received notice. The Air Force Reserve. Right. I just found out I was going to be furloughed. So I had about four or five months to find a job. Because food's important. And that would play a role. That played a role in this Russian interest in this contract. You were dealing with Russian... Um, engineers and pilots and maintainers that because of the end of the cold war were looking for work they were out of work and they had they were all basically it was like the wild west they were less mm. these entire you know the premier flight the equivalent of edwards air force base dryden yeah. flight center was left to its own devices to go figure out how to make money so that's and they were yeah, oh, they were still on the, the government payroll, but there's no pay in the role. There's no pay in the they found work. Roger. So they were left to go out and become entrepreneurial themselves, which is what this program was an example of. Wow. Uh, it's hard to imagine that the the shock to the system for somebody who's been on the you know part of the Soviet Soviet um, structure, everything's guaranteed. And they're kind of at the top of the Soviet structure in terms of status and probably relatively money. Um, and now they're, uh, we'll fly for food. Kind of, they they we'll absolutely my were, fighter they absolutely food. were. And that just, that just heightened the shock as far as our perception yeah. of dealing with them. They, you know, here we are, we used to be, you know, a year ago, we were at the top of the pyramid and now we're out, you know, begging for, for work out from the West. So uh, we had to be sensitive. real example of necessity is the mother mother of invention. So I was in an event today where we honored somebody who serves one of the charities I work with, the Armed Services YMCA in Hawaii, and um, I talked about the transition to Hawaii. And one of the things I've learned here is be nice, <laughs> because you never know how you're going to intersect. And this story of potentially making this deal is the matter of friendship. The friendships formed in your circles with the Navy when you were a Navy exchange pilot or exchange Air Force exchange pilot with the Navy, I should say. And um, folks, if you can hear the blinds rattling in the background, sorry, it's a little windy and alarming. And also credibility. And I, I want to hit that because, uh, because frankly, I think society's lost sight of that. 
the beautiful thing about being a fighter pilot is you got to be able to fly. And you had credibility with the Navy. Um, the Navy had credibility with you. These were very credible um, aviators on the Russian side. And without that, nobody would have been interested. Safe to no, say? I, I agree. And uh, as I said, the guy that reached out to me on this program was uh, Skipper Os Pearson, the same guy that mm -hmm. asked me to go. And so he and I were known to each other. So I think there was a level of uh, uh, comfort and uh, on his part that uh, they, they could trust me to uh, not only come in and put something together, but get the right group of guys around us to man the thing once it went down, yeah. down range and, and pull it off. So you have this concept and now it's up to you and a guy named Broadway Perosi, one of your colleagues from VX4, I think it was. Yes. And you're going to go to Russia, get checked out in the Su-27, and then you're going to fly to Singapore for an air show and demonstrate to everybody what a cool idea this is. What? Is that right? That, that was the plan. Part of it came came to fruition. We never, we didn't. Yeah, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, the flying to Singapore from Mo the outskirts of Moscow. Right. Uh, first of all, intrigues me. Folks, go go to Google Maps and look at the countries that are between here and there, not to mention the mountains like the Himalayas. Um, it's, <laughs> what an idea. What an adventure this had to be. This had to be. Just even thinking about this had to have a twilight zone element to it. Oh, I, I told you, I think I, I mentioned before, you know, we're, we're flying and we're on final. Uh, it's on a Delta airplane out of New York on final into Moscow. And it was just all surreal. I, and I, I made the comment that I felt like Captain Kirk on his first visit to the Klingon home world. It just didn't seem, it didn't seem real. It didn't seem right. But very quickly, in just a matter of days, things settled down, and and there were some you know one-off things that we would we would have happen to us and so forth that would remind us that it's not the same. But it uh, it began to swung began to swing more towards normal, and we became relatively comfortable uh, quickly. Yeah, it's, for those who didn't live it, it's hard to explain how seismic the shift was. Yeah. Because you were uh, an F-15 pilot in your first assignment at Bitburg Air Base, Germany. The job of the um, 36th fighter wing, right? Right. At Bitburg was to shoot down Soviet airplanes, depending your when we, as we all knew they would, the Soviets invaded, the Warsaw Pact invaded. That was your focus. As a young F-4 pilot, I was a nuke strike pilot. My job was to go drop a nuclear weapon on a classified target on the other side of the line. That was our life, and you, perhaps until Russia invaded Ukraine, it was uh, it's been unimaginable for twenty five or thirty years. So you made that shift from the imaginable, imaginable to the unimaginable in a few months. Wow! Um, so that was the concept. You were you were going to do that. You're all set to do that. But what I think our viewers really want to hear about is what it was like to fly the Su-27 flanker. Before we talk about that, let me plug the uh, perhaps more serious uh, episode we're going to do at some point. Time to be announced, but please watch for it. Uh, Jay Fidel, the president and CEO and one of the founders of Think Tech Hawaii, is going to interview Dallas and I and talk about this thing we think is very important, collective nuclear blackmail. Uh, imagine, just imagine. So please keep an eye open for that. I'll be back with Pigments in two weeks. <laughs> Another interesting episode. My government ordered me to bomb Hawaii. That's all I'm going to say about it. All right. Okay, Dallas, let's talk about flying the, the mighty uh, flanker. And... Um, you had to go through a lot to get there in a demanding environment. You, one of the pictures you provided me is this snowscape. That looks cold, brother. It was cold. It, it looks very cold. It looks cold, and it's got it's so iconic. All the the Russian, previously Soviet aircraft, strew, kind of strewn about on the flight line. Uh, 
one of the dichotomies that I mentioned to you before is you look at that snowscape. Mm -hmm. And then when we went out to do our first walk around of the airplane out on the ramp, it was immaculate. The, yeah. The wheel wells, you know, everything was, uh, it was uh, pristine. Cockpit was pristine. It's a, I mean, and it's a big airplane. It's bigger than the Tomcat, but it, uh, it is a sleek, it's a pretty. So let's, let's talk a little more about that because that's kind of shocking. In a second before we do that, I would say all this involved a lot of preparation, briefing, academics, um, and this picture and socialization. You talked about the international vodka cons consumption competition, whatever you call it. Um, uh, so you did that. You met a guy, this guy, um, Sergey. And I'm going to try to pronounce his name again. Sergey, help me out. Vet Trez, Tresvietsky. Tresvietsky. In an article I saw that you wrote about this experience, you made a comment that intrigued me. You said you soon became best friends, but he didn't speak any, or very good friends. Very little. He, he didn't speak any English, and that resonated because I've been through that with a, a, a couple of guys in Vietnam, including one of their aces, one of their six kill aces where we don't share a common language but as warriors aviators doesn't matter How, tell me just a bit about the friendship with Sergey. well again as i uh, told you he was the business partner uh, he was not our instructor pilot another guy named right. 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 Was the instructor pilot but because of that we met with sergey almost every day and as it turned out mm -hmm. as we got into this and it was apparent that all of these challenges that we were having with our training, the, no dash one or NATOPS manual, no simulator, no books, <laughs> no <laughs> books. We're having a book free uh, training environment and, and, and everything. Sergey was really, uh, and his translator, the lady, uh, Galina Sakharova, that was in this yeah. picture, uh, really leaned forward to try to make this work. Now, this was not, uh, I mean, it's, it's in their own self-interest to have this thing. Sure. Fruition. But they, and when we realized how much they were actually pushing as far as they could on their mm -hmm. side to get some things done, then that that gained trust uh, on our part. Uh, that uh, do, you, do you still stay in touch with Sergey? No, we lost touch. We lost yeah. touch a few a, a few years ago. Many years after this, they came and visited us. Uh, he and Galena came and visited yeah. us when we had a place down in Marble Falls, and we stayed close for a while, but we lost touch. So I had a, a, a moment with a, a senior Vietnamese official when I was director at APCSS or I was speaking to him. He didn't speak English. His deputy, who was a great guy, uh, uh, he, he's just a great guy. But I said to the principal through his, the translator, um, you know, 40 years ago today, as it happened, was the heaviest bombing of uh, Vietnam by the U.S. And here we are making peace mm -hmm. um, and cooperating and uh, the translator translated and then his deputy who spoke, speaks perfect perfect english said i know because 40 years ago i was sitting on a 57 millimeter anti-aircraft site shooting at american or a 57 millimeter anti-aircraft site uh, shooting at american airplanes and I said, well, that's interesting because I've been shot at by 57 millimeter uh, in an aircraft, not from the Vietnamese, but I bet we have a whole different view of that dealio. And there's a, the humanity matters more than the previous uh, antipathy, whatever. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the old warriors, there's a value to old warriors meeting. Um, so, you go through all this. As you said, it was a book-free environment. You know, most of the training programs that I've been involved with involved manuals and diagrams of the airplane. Dallas, did you have that? We did not. No, I've got one sitting. It's I've got crazy. one now. Dude. You know, after we were done, they handed me a, the flight manual and said, here you go. Uh, yeah, now, now that you're done. Now that we're done. But uh, no, we didn't. So it was, uh, but we made it work. And uh, yeah. literally, literally, Broadway and I would sit and diagram whatever the session was, what hydraulics, electrical system, whatever. We diagram, so, we show it to the tech and say, is this so we, Well, 
uh, I hope you can draw because I can. Um, so on the left on the screen, folks, is the, the working that problem. But on the right is a guy with a camera because the the flip side of the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit of necessity and the friendship from Sergey and Galena, et cetera, is the suspicion you were under. So you were filmed constantly. That guy right? met us, that guy met us at Custom. And For two he, months. And he was pretty much everywhere we went. Uh, the TikTok generation might think that was cool. That would be cool for me for about, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds. Yeah, it got old. Wow. Got old. And you were under suspicion, not Sergey, but others thought that you were, you might be CIA operatives sent there to basically spy from in, in the cockpit. This this came out at when we're getting ready. To, I'm getting ready to make my first flight, the first flight. So I was going to mm -hmm. go. Kavacher and I had already briefed the hop. Everything we're ready to go. I'm putting on my G suit and get my harness and helmet and so forth. And one of the aeronautical engineers that worked for Sergey, a guy named Vasily Akramayev, walked into life support there and had had his head down and wouldn't look. And I knew something was going on. And then he said. Hey, uh, you guys have got to realize that all of these flights, uh, you need to fly in the back seat instead of the front seat. As, instead of the front as seat, agreed upon, as agreed upon. And that's when I looked up at Vasily, and and he said, "That's that's that's it." And I started taking off my G suit and hanging up my gear, and I looked over at Sergey, and I said, "That cancels the contract. That cancels everything. We're going back to the. They had us uh, billeted in a wow. KGB." general's resort spa yeah. i said we're going back to the spa and uh, work on our getting our way home that wow. sergey went and talked to the 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 head of the research institute uh, at gromov and basically worked a deal that if we agreed to fly the first flight in the back seat kavacher would then go to this guy the director was a guy named uh, uh konstantin uh, vasilchenka and uh, Kavacher would go and give him a thumbs up as to whether we really were pilots. So you proved you weren't spies. Uh, we, we, I wish we had more time. We'll do more time on this later, probably someday. Um, but Kavacher is Anatoly Kavacher, your instructor pilot. As it turns out, he and Sergey are the principals in two of the most watched ejection sequences yes. in the world. Um, Sergey from a MiG-29 that has a right engine stall stag at the Paris Air Show and uh, Anatoly from his airplane being cut in half by another MiG-29 at a British Air Show. Right. Did that cause you any concern? The, no, but what is it both been in high profile ejection? I mean, we it, it got our attention, but I, with Broadway and I both said we we paid a lot of attention to our ejection seat training. Uh, <laughs> Roger. When, when we finally... We finally got it. Okay, so uh, there's so much to talk about here, but eventually you fly two backseat, one front seat ride. One it one back seat, one back seat, one three, back three front seat. Three front seat. Okay, sorry. Three front seat. That's right. Yeah. And um so tell me about flying the Su-27 flanker from how the cockpit just Talk to another fighter. I, I'm with with you in the O Club bar, and I say, Dallas, you flew, flew the flanker. Tell me about it. You know, uh, I wouldn't just say, "Tell me about it." There'd be another word there. Beautiful airplane. Good things, bad things. Big bubble canopy. Visibility was bad in all quarters. The head box of the ejection seat was about this big. They wanted you to sit the ejection seat so low, or it was a CG type thing, so it could meet its zero zero wow. requirements. But when you put it there, the stick grip was so far above your lap, you couldn't rest your elbow on your knee to fly. So I did that wow. once, and then I raised the seat all the way up and said, I'm not going to eject anyone. Anyway. Yeah. I'm going to do this. So there were, there were bad things. Roll rate, as, I, as you mentioned something, the roll rate was like a Tomcat with the wings all the way forward. It was, it was not good. The thing was absolutely phenomenal, the most impressive over any aircraft I've ever flown. The term is piece of best, but let's just call it power. Yeah, brute uh, power. Brute, brute power and and uh control in the in the pitch axis. 
it was a bull moose. It just, you could power through. Like I, I told uh, one day went out and I just set the, got to 450 knots, set the power, went to blower. I did three loops in Bullet succession. Yeah. Wow. Each, Holy moly. Okay. So each, that means something to me. And, but each one was completed in less than 2,500 feet vertical. And at the end of the third one, all I did was momentarily unload and I was back up to four and a quarter to 425 now. So let me ask you this, um, because we both flew different versions of the Viper, the F-16, and early and late engines in the in the F-15 Eagle. Uh, could you be pretty free with your throttle movement? Yes. Put it wherever the heck you want it without yes. worrying about the sounds and parts that are going to come out of the back of the engine? No, it was like an, it was like an Eagle with a digital uh, electronic control. Deke. Yeah. The Deke. Uh, yeah. uh, very much unlike the Tomcat and the TF-30. Where I right once I put the throttles anywhere I didn't I didn't move. Interesting. Um, is it your favorite airplane ever? No. Uh, I know I knew that, but I had uh, this. And again, when I got back and we started going around and briefing, you know, going to different squadrons, and we went to the UK, we went to Sweden, we went to Saudi Arabia, we went to Belgium and Netherlands and so forth, and whenever. We would be talking to a group of fighter pilots. That was the question that they would ask. Of course, yeah. You know, and I and I would go and say, "Hey, that it's a beautiful airplane. I enjoyed flying it. It there are things that are not optimum. I, I loved flying the F sixteen. Uh, loved all that. Uh, loved flying, taking the Hornet to the ship. But my first fighter was the was the Eagle, and it's yeah. always got a soft spot in my heart. We'll okay, Ernest Hemingway. Yeah. Um, but I'll say it was, the Eagle wasn't my first fighter, and I flew uh, both the F-4, F-15, F-16, F-16 in combat. Uh, it's a great airplane, but the Eagle is unique, and that's part of why it has a 104 to 0 kill ratio, and it's just a beautiful airplane. Easy to land? Looks like it would be no, easy. It, oh, land. absolutely. You know, the first in, yeah. uh, on that flight when I was flying from the back seat, all Anatoly yeah. did was start the engines and lower the yeah. canopy. And he gave me the airplane. So other than that, and then he demoed the first Cobra and he demoed the first yeah. tail slide. Uh, he didn't touch the stick the entire time. So first landing, I'm coming in and it's a straight in. It's like a yeah. four man's ILS. And it's, it was easier. It was easier than the Eagle from the backseat, about like a T3. Well, e Eagle's pretty damn easy. So yeah, that's saying something. But it's, it's okay, sits, that backseat sits quite a bit higher. Yeah, I, and I can picture that. Um, I wish we had more time, and that's a good way to be in an episode where you're not going to, how do I stretch this out? But um, so you spent two months over there with the Russian aerospace industry and the military connection and the probably the KGB as well. Oh, definitely. Uh, in, in a very um, turbulent point of transition is there anything you observe that you that you think about now as you look at the invasion of ukraine and the tragic outcome of that i i spoke to it when i wrote that article years ago about there's an institutional aversion within russian training and within the way they construct their airplanes to mm -hmm. allowing a pilot to take an airplane to the absolute limits and trusting mm -hmm. the pilot there was things in the flight control system where it would take control of the airplane from the pilot. The way that, and this is this is not meant to be uh, derogatory, but they're very linear. They're very, you could say, plotting. Mm -hmm. When I watched when I watched that uh, that caravan north of Kiev sit there for a week or ten oh, days geez. and not move. And yeah. there's no initiative to go and do anything. And there's there. Well, I had some ideas. Yeah, I, I mean, I had some ideas on how to do it too. But yeah. I that that is their mindset. There's nobody wow. in that wow. caravan that's going to go. I've got it. We're going to figure this out. We're going to go this way. So uh, let me take that uh, the next step, and then we'll sadly have to wrap up. To me, that explains why they've devolved to an extremely brute force approach to just throwing iron on target, including Concur. shopping malls today. 
um, it's just they're they're just going to keep pounding until they achieve their objectives, which is uh, there's much more commentary in that. But, but uh, a sad state of affairs, somewhat predictable, I would say. Well, Dallas, thanks, man. I will see you with uh, Jay on um, on an episode of Military in Hawaii uh, sometime soon. We'll find out uh, if it's Wednesday or not. I always finish with, with uh, asking what uh, the guest's next figment is. We asked Dallas that last week, and we've got a shared figment, and it is to um, open people's eyes to this concept of nuclear blackmail and how the United States has to rethink its strategy and operations and equipment for deterring and defending against nuclear blackmail from anybody who might seek to do it. But on a lighter note, I then end with, what would Fig do? I've got another movie for you folks. It's Jet Pilot, starring John Wayne and Janet Lee from 19... 57 it was actually filmed, I think, from 1949 uh, to 1954. It was a Howard Hughes movie, his favorite movie, it said. It's a Cold War drama and romance. I'm going to see if I can get my screen to the movie poster of it. Let me read you the, the uh, poster. Jet flame action, jet hot thrills, exploding with all the power of the jet age, with all the passion of a daring love story. It's actually a very entertaining movie and will give you some interesting insight into the events of the day. So um, don't forget, you can find our uh, QR codes or you can find our episode lists on uh, web, the web here, as you see. Uh, please do that. I use that uh, not just to find other episodes, but to make sure I'm not wearing the same shirt two shows in a row. And I want to finish by thanking Think Tech Hawaii, a great nonprofit corporation over 20 years of enabling citizen journalists like me and Dallas. So thanks for watching and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.